prone to just want to give kind of personal introductions, but our next guest is so impressive, I don't want to miss any of the highlights. I'm not going to read the whole bio. Don't. I won't. <laughs> but I've chosen the parts I like. I don't so, know what's on there. So just like uh, my last introduction, most of you know we have some great allied partners. One of our distinguished partners is the Wilson Sporting Good uh, Company, and we're just delighted uh, that they are so much a part of our, our convention. They sponsor our Coach of the Year awards. They will be party to our, our banquet uh, this evening, and they are bringing our next presenter to us. I want to thank uh, Cy and, and Tim from, from Wilson. So Nick Saviano obviously has had a distinguished uh, career, one of the most sought after developmental coaches around the world. These are the stats that I wanted to read. He's coached and helped develop more than 50 ATP WTA players, Grand Slam winners, world number one, Junior Wimbledon US Open, 24 USTA national champions, more than 25 ITF junior champions. Pretty impressive resume. Uh, as a player, Nick was a top ranked junior, two times Stanford All-American, part of an NCAA championship team, world-class ATP tour professional nine years, achieved top 50 singles with over with wins over top 10 players en route to four ATP titles. But kind of as a scholar teacher, authored Maximum Tennis, 10 Keys to Unleash Unleashing Your On-Court Potential, one of the best-selling tennis books in the world. Please join me in helping to welcome Nick Saviano and Fred. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here. And those of you that know me, I was just saying I feel um, a little bit old. I don't say that in a negative way. But when you look at coaches that are at Stanford and other universities, and you first met the coaches at the 12 and under national camp, you begin to realize you're getting up there. So it's been about 40 something years and uh, that I've been coaching or uh, playing at a, a world-class level. So you, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of things you see and, and learn. So I'm very, very excited and humbled to be here. Uh, you may say, well, yeah, you're humbled to be here. Yeah, I am. Seriously. It's, it's an unbelievable opportunity for me because I learn. And I, I really mean that. I have to work through my presentation. I have to get something that's relevant to all of you to honor your presence here. I respect your time and I don't want to waste your time. So the things I'm going to talk about today are not, are not just kind of passe. They're what I feel are some of the most important things in the world. Yeah, in terms of in coaching. Fundamental principles of optimum technique. What's my goal today? My goal is going to be to try to maybe mention one or two things you haven't heard before, reaffirm some of the things you already know, um, reinforcing various things. So if I can do that or provoke some thought, I've done a good job. Now to start, I too want to thank Wilson Corporation for sponsoring me here. Best company in the world, I'm a little biased, but you know, I'm a walking billboard for Wilson. Um, I also want to thank the ITA for inviting me and uh, having me here. Um, I have with me two gentlemen, Alexander Palaz, who is with us at Saviano High Performance Tennis. Alexander was at Illinois State, is an outstanding player, and uh, as you saw, and also Greg Orlett. And Greg was from University of Florida, and now he's the assistant coach at Iowa. So how about a warm welcome for these gentlemen. Now, without further ado, I want to get right into the topic. And I have, I'm going to do a little forehand. And everything I do out here, I have a reason. Everything. So. Can you feed me one ball? What does this look like? World-class player. You probably would know. For it. 
Who looks like that? Huh? Yeah, is exactly right. He goes like this. Now, how many of you coach that way? He's a world-class player, isn't he? So what's my point? What do you think my point is? Just because somebody's world-class doesn't mean it's a fundamental principle and it's the optimum technique. The game has changed dramatically. What we are looking at is trying to determine, at least I do, what the fundamental principles of the game are and what are just what I would call regular fundamentals, but fundamental principles. What do I mean by that? I'm going to explain because it's important when I go forward. Now, if I was doing a demonstration just to kind of dazzle you, I'd be hitting the ball right away and all this. But this is, an, this is a very highly skilled, knowledgeable group. So bear with me. For me, and this is important, fundamental principles um, of optimum technique, they transcend virtually all levels of play. Period. Aside from true beginners, after that, they are applicable. And they will, if you work with a player, and believe me, I go from an eight-year-old on the court, I'm not exaggerating, to walking on the court with a world-class player. I have one parent I'm talking to last night, I, you know, I won't, I'll leave it vague. Their child just won the Orange Bowl. Um, I, I've got, so you're dealing with all different levels, and a lot of this stuff applies. Now, they are applicable, like I said, at any stage, and they transcend time. Now, I'm going to do something here. Uh, these, these gentlemen don't, don't even know where, where I'm going with this. Okay? What I want is for you to feed me two forehands. Watch my technique. And, and I'm not joking about this. I was a world-class player. I'm not a world-class player now, but a basic technique. Just feed me a few forehands. Watch. One more. One more. <laughs> How the heck did I miss that ball? I never, no, I'm just kidding. <sighs> okay, now, I want you to watch Alex hit. And I'm being very serious. Alex, go ahead and hit the ball. Four inches. Hit it. Let me see you hit it. Yes. Rip it. He doesn't know what I'm asking. Now, very good. You were probably kind of impressed with my racket and speed. I know. I get it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? No. no, exactly. Here's the point, and this is the key. Some of the fundamental principles, we did exactly the same. But do you know the generation? How old are you? 27. I am 33 years older than he is. <laughs> There's a young guy laughing at me out there. No, I'm 33 years. But how could there possibly be fundamental principles that are the same? Well, you know what? I saw a video the other day. You know, it was a great backhand. And it was uh, Babrinka or whatever. He was hitting a backhand. He was doing this open stance. He's hitting it like that. And I saw another backhand. And this guy's ripping it. I'm not kidding you, I'm not exaggerating. Open stance and hitting it like this, I couldn't believe he's ripping it. You know who that was? Don Budge. For those who are young, do you know what Don Budge is? Don Budge is probably 60 years ago. So one of the things that I want to go over are the fundamental principles that transcend time, that apply to every level, that apply to the collegiate players, that applies to the 10-year-old that applies to players that are top on your team, bottom on your team. Before I'm working with a player, before the finals of a Grand Slam, I'm going over some of the similar things. That's what I want to highlight. And I picked out, you see the, the, um, the outline there? 
I picked out two really exciting and exotic fundamentals. Did you see that? What I put down there? I mean, these are really, really exotic. Uh, ball watching and split step. Really? Why would I get into this? I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute. Okay, so let's get started here. Alex, I want you to hit I want you to hit a little bit side to side, okay? And just take your time and rip some balls side to side. I just want you to get a feel for his ball striking. He's really a talented uh, young man. I, uh, if I met him younger, this is somebody that, that in my opinion, had world-class potential. Now, okay. One of the things you notice the way he hits the ball, I'm going to go over characteristics of the fundamental principles of optimum technique. I'm going to zip through this really quickly. Now, I spent a lot of time on this. One, the rhythmic, repeatable, and adaptable. They're very rhythmic. You notice, notice how rhythmic he is? Go ahead and hit a couple more. Notice his rhythm and how smooth he is. This is basically what you see on the Pro Tour. You watch players hit. Okay, second, they, does it, stop a second, does it look complicated? Does it ever look complicated when you watch Djokovic? Does it ever look complicated when you watch a great serve where they got 50 hitches and so on? No, no. So I say it's fairly simplistic. I say that to you folks because you are experienced coaches. The third, it's biomechanically efficient, which ties right in with the simplicity. It's biomechanically efficient, smooth, it's, uh, it prevents injuries, it maximizes power. It's, uh, this is a big one. It's effective at slow speeds and fast speeds. I watch players and in 30 seconds, half of the time I can tell what level of player they are before they hit four balls. Because there's certain characteristics that they don't have, and I said, no shot, not at a high speed. Okay, and they're tactically flexible and versatile. So they can do anything. Can you play a high and heavy ball? Even that, hit them a little deeper. Yeah, and high and heavy, putting pressure. It's a nice ball. That's good. He's got a nice stroke, doesn't he? Okay, good. And here's, here is, if you, if you understand where I'm going, it's personally combat, compatible. It ties in with their personality, their physical attributes. It never fights against it. So those are the characteristics. Finally, and then we'll get hit. Why do you think, just beat me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna split, I'm gonna do the demo. I'm gonna split, watch me, I'm splitting, I'm watching the ball. Okay, thank you very much, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Why would I pick these two? What am I doing out here? Why do I pick these two? And I hope you stay with me here, because this is all my years of coaching because when somebody learns to watch the ball properly and well on the hip and they split properly i believe they are the two most important fundamentals in the game and that that means also that they are the most significant psychological beneficial factors that you can do on a court, psychologically. Now you're saying to me, no way. But I'm gonna go on here and present, and I'm telling you, if you are focused on the hit, on the hitting right on the contact, and you are splitting properly, you're absolutely in the moment, and you are 
psychologically where you need to be. I am telling you, you can look three, four courts down watching matches and say choking, not choking, choking, just on those two factors alone. Think about that for a minute. And I, I am absolutely serious. I'm not overstating in, from my perspective. Now, let's go to the hitting. Watching the ball, I'm going to demo here. Now you're going to you're going to you're going to come up and feed to me, and then I'm going to demo because there are a couple things that I, I I am not an expert on the visual system. I study it, but you have the two primary types. You have your central vision, and this is as a coach you need to know this. In my view, as a coach, the players only need to know a little bit. There are a few basic comments. Central vision and peripheral vision. Now, first thing, when a player's playing, watch my face. How many times you see this? And watch me, do not watch the ball. And you see your players do that, the face is tight, they're tight. Do you, all of you, try to tighten your face and be relaxed with your body. It's not happening. So watch what I'm doing here. Ah. Okay, what are the negative effects of that? Tension. Tension. This is really important. Stay with me here. What are the negative effects of that? This is critical that you know this. Spending too much energy. Not what I'm looking for. Yes. Breathing. So yes. I want you to I want you to know something. As your your player's tension elevates towards fear. They lose the quality of their peripheral vision. It starts diminishing. What does that mean? What does it mean if you start losing? You have your central vision, which is the part where I'm gazing right here, watch my eyes, right on the target, okay? But if I'm tense, I lose what my peripheral skills to a great extent. This is one of the number one reasons why. How many of you had, it's a big point, your team, it's on the line, he's got the forehand, he's right there, it's an easy shot, and he goes, and he shanks it wide. None of you have experienced that? How many times have you seen that, they get tight and they shank? Well, there's a very specific reason with the visual system why they do that. So. A couple things that I want to go over. Now, Greg, you're going to go all the way back, and I'm going to explain to you. When, when Greg is hitting, he's going to stand in a corner, and Alex is going to move. When, go ahead and hit. Now, why stay over with me. When the ball gets close to Alex, I mean, gets close to Greg, his, his visual system is drawing in an enormous amount of information. It's not focused just in on the ball. And this is, I'm not trying to be overly technical. This is for coaches to understand, not for the players. So as he's about to hit the ball, he's hitting the ball, right before the visual system, the peripheral vision is gathering enormous information. Central is more focused on the ball. Now, I'm, a, I'm getting to some points here. Here we go, watch again. See, right as the ball is being hit, he's seeing more than just the ball right here. That's the first thing. Now, secondly, and you'll see why this becomes so important. From the central vision, as he com comes here, He's going to see it okay. What do you think happens if he gets tight and nervous? What is that? This, this may change the way you approach your players when you know they're scared. It borders the vision. Hmm? It narrows the vision. It narrows the vision. Their ability to perceive the tracking of the ball diminishes. So they have difficulty gauging the ball coming forward. How many of you have been in a movie theater, the ball, they, have, they put the lights out and they have something coming at you, you can't tell? That's because you have no silent background. 
So when your player is unbelievably scared and you go out on the court, do you think you want to tell him what he should do tactically? I'd be trying to relax him. Okay, that's, that's, the first, that's the second thing. Go ahead. They hit a couple more. So as the ball's coming, if he's, Alex is nice and relaxed here, so he's seen the ball well. He's tracking it well. Now, here's the third thing with the peripheral vision that's important to know. This, I'm gonna mention something to you. I'm gonna make a statement here in a minute. I'm gonna upset a lot of people. But, all right, so right here when I hit, okay, I'll go right here. See, when I'm here, how do I know where to hit the ball? If my eyes are here, how do I know where to hit the ball? Does anyone know? Well, how does the brain know? If I'm looking here, how does it know what's there? It knows what's there based on what the visual system sees here. If there was not, no markings anywhere and no markings, it wouldn't know where to go. It'd have a general rule, a general idea. So again, the peripheral vision being relaxed and focus the facial muscles. Who's the most relaxed guy you've seen hit the ball? Better. Roger. Oh yeah, he's the best of all time. Not a coincidence. You know who else was unbelievable that way? Four. Chris Evert. Uh, Billie Jean King. Um, Djokovic on his backhand, not so much on his forehand. Nadal. Now, They'll go like this and exert energy, but there's not so much tension in their face when they're hitting. And right here, if you don't have great peripheral vision, then you're not great at projecting exactly where to go. And let me show you something. I've never showed this probably before, because I do this at the academy. This is more practical. This is one of the, in my opinion, the drills. I'm going to say something about drilling. I, you know, I don't... Okay? Now I tell my kids, they are not allowed to look at this ball. Why? Because when they go down here like this, they're using their central vision for what the peripheral vision should be doing. And I just explained to you how important it is. So I tell them they have to hit, come around here. I know where this is. Look, I'm looking up here because I know where I'm at. I can dance around the balls maybe could get a little bit closer because I know where I am. So if I come over here and I'm focused here and I'm hitting, I know where the court is. And I'm going to make one other statement. Maybe I should do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think all of this stuff with the, these things on the ground and these ladders, I think is garbage. Sorry, I don't like it. Tell me where we play athletically and we go, really? Seriously? What do we do in our sport where we're like this? Oh, I was watching some ballet dancers the other day and they were all like this. No. No. I don't believe in that. I believe the eyes should be up and movement should be trained accordingly. This is where we move, not this way. So why do we train looking down? Players should look up and understand their environment when they are training. So for me personally, I don't like that, that set of drills. Okay, so I've said enough, probably offended enough people. Um, okay, I did that. Okay. Now, the visual system, fastest way, some of the, the most important things. You're gonna move uh, Alex around quite a bit, sorry. Yeah, you can, you can look, you better not look down. I'll fireball at you. Okay, so just focus on Alex because uh, that's the only way you get the full breadth of uh, what we're doing. Just move, move him around and as I said, he is, a good hitter of the ball. He can move. 
Now what I want him aware of, and this gets a little bit ahead, I want him focused not, I don't want him focused on where the ball's going. Not consciously. I don't want conscious thought process. If you, how many watch a player and they go like this and they stumble on a court? Really good athlete, you ever had that? What do you think happens? What do you think's happening like that? How many times do you see the pros do that, where they stumble and fall somewhere kind of, not that often, but occasionally. What do you think is happening when they do that? Change your mind. Change your mind? How about, I don't know that I would say they may have changed their mind, I'm just telling you now, they are in, not in a subconscious process. They are consciously trying to think of where the ball's going, what's going to happen, and it does not work. That's why they call when players are playing great, what do they call it? Zone, Zone flow, whatever. But I can assure you, they're not in conscious thought process. So when you see your athlete leaning and stumbling in one direction, the other direction, they're out of the moment. So I want him focused on when the person is hitting the ball, go ahead. And that gets him prepared right at the correct time to absorb information. Now, he won't even be consciously thinking about that, but it's an easy way to grasp and to get him without trying to guess where the ball is going. The other thing that I'm looking for, hold on, when he goes to move, to maximize the visual system, he's uh, really strong and the pros are strong. They come down in here, upper body, the chin is up, and as they move, there's very, very little bopping. Because if you're going like this, it's very tough to track a ball. So you want chin up and they split. I actually like a term, I'm not saying this, this is just me personally. I like him to up with the hands, down with the body, and here more like this. And even a back end coming up a little bit, but that's that's a, not a fundamental principle. <laughs> but this is chin up, moving so that it's like a ballet dance at the highest levels. He's got a hit. I'll do it again slowly, but I come out in here, I'm down, load. Very little movement, chin up. That is optimal for tracking the ball. That's what I mean by watching the ball. Watching the ball properly is not about just when it's hit here on the strength here. That's a fallacy. That's a myopic perspective. I'm with college coaches, so I can use good words. Um, very, very, very narrow perspective. It's about how you track the ball, what kind of information you read from your opponent. And I'm gonna get to the end, I'm gonna show you how to simply do this. Okay, a couple more. This is perfection right here, because we did a video. Don't let me down now, Alex. Show me good watching ball, come on now. Yeah, that's so weird. Just follow out. Don't watch the ball. Sorry about that, Greg. You're a wonderful player, but right now we're not highlighting it. Now I'm going to say one other thing. When do you think, okay, now I'm going to surprise Greg here, okay? These are all important points. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to zip. Okay. All right. I'm going to feed you a ball. There's no trick to this. If I gave you your choice, this is a really important part of my talk. If I gave you your choice, and he does not know what I'm going to ask him, to hit, you can hit either way, no trick, just choose where you want to hit and hit it there. However, once you make that decision, okay, I'll feed you the ball, once you make the decision, say now. Okay? Here we go. Good. Again? Okay, what do you notice? He makes that decision pretty quickly. Most players do. Don't forget that. The decision on having a target is made well in advance. All right? So now I'm going to go to the specifics of ball watching.
this is this is pretty technical but also it's very simple number one I'm gonna demo this Greg can you bring the card up and number one in my, from my perspective and this is one of the poorest things I think that most most American players certainly do is you get a lot of this watch me not the ball when uh, I, I mean no, no disrespect to Roddick who was a great player when he's 17 I tried to convince him he's got to work on watching the ball and you know closer keeping his head still but I wasn't particularly close to then he's a nice guy but we weren't very close and it's one of the reasons why he always got beat up with uh, Federer. Because when you pull your head out, tell me, how many of your players want to look, want to take a ball on the rise when they're like this? Ain't happening. You know who else has that problem? Andy Murray had that problem. Great player, but really could win three or four more Grand Slams. And a lot of times his forehand lets him down. So, number one. Head position, right here towards the contact point and slightly out front. Watch, I'll hit one, all slow motion. I mean, I really can explode on the ball, but I don't want to display that right now. So I'm gonna keep my head. <laughs> Give no respect. Out there. there we go, watch. See, now my head's there, right out front, go ahead. And there are a couple things I'm going to say here in a second, right out front and I'm watching the ball on the hit. Now, do I turn my head on the hit like this? Oh boy, how many shots have you seen like that? The head and the visual system needs to stay at the <coughs> contact point slightly after the hit. Watch, right here, two separate moves. It is not one move. If you want to be great, if you want your player to be totally absorbed in the moment, if you want your player to be an incredible pressure player, teach him this. Head still, and then up. Head still, and then up. Now, those are two fundamentals. Now, how long you keep your head there, a split second, I'll share with you what I Tell my players, this you can take it or leave it. I don't necessarily put this quite at the level of a fundamental principle. I will say keeping the eyes there slightly after the hit is, I like, well let me digress. Here's what you want to be careful about. Watch this. My head staying there too long and me swinging with just my arm. Go ahead. Okay, that's dangerous for the stroke. So, I want the head out here, stays there until the back shoulder drives into the chin. Watch, I'll do one fairly fast. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have um, Alex do one. Watch this. Head stays still, and then I come out. You see how it drives into it? It would be the same thing, I have a one hand and a back hand, but the same thing on the backhand, boom, and then up. One more. And then up. Djokovic, Murray, Nadal, Chris Everett, Serena Williams, not quite as good. Uh, the best of the best keep their chin there until the back shoulder drives into the chin. On the forehand, not as many, but who are the two best forehands of all time? Three best. Who would you say? Three best forehands of all time. Give me a name. Sampras. Sampras? Yeah. Who else? Federer. Yeah. Nadal's pretty darn good. And Borg had a great forehand. All four are great ball watchers, and all four will tend to have the shoulder come into the chin before they drive up. Very important. Okay, so watch Alex do this really fast. Now, he's got great racket at speed. This is, um, I'm not flattering him here, but he has world-class racket at speed. Yeah, keep that chin there. 
and then go ahead and rip it. Now you see how solid, stop, you see how solid that looked? Was that a beautiful stroke or what? Beautiful. I mean, give it a round of applause. <laughs> he's right there, he's exploding. Now why is this so critical? Aside from the fact that mentally you're here in a moment. Well, I'll tell you why. Because how many of your players, I was taught like this. Here. How many of you know, the, the older guys and gals in the group, we were taught like this. There was much, mostly linear, mostly linear movement. That's not the way it is now. There's a lot of rotational force with players exploding. If this head is moving, they are totally out of control. And that's why these guys look so incredibly smooth. Their head is still, the visual system is here on the hit. And when your players, your players, if they have nice technique and you see them shanking, it has more to do with them being out of the moment psychologically and losing control on the visual system. By the way, about 80% of the brain's information is processed through the visual system. You control the visual system and you're in pretty good shape. Okay. All right, let me see where I'm at here because I know I'm running late. Um, all right, now I'm going to tie it together. Are you, are you with me here? Uh, you may not agree with me on this. We have so many distinguished people out here. I'm feeling stressed that they may not agree with me. No, not really. <laughs> I, I do it the way I think is. I, trust me, I'm always, I mean, I love hearing everyone's perspective, but I'm not afraid to be vulnerable and say what, what I truly believe. Um, this gets back, remember what I said before about the target? The target, this is to finish this whole concept. And I, 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 I was saying how the target was established early, okay? Well then I believe that on the hit, if you could feed me a ball, I'm gonna make a decision, I'll just tell you when. Now, I made the decision I was going down the line. That's a little bit, it's pretty early. Um, Alex, I want him to have a target, but that's established early. But right here, and listen to me closely here, right here, if you said, my life depends on me making the shot, now I'm feeling stressed. Okay. And I've got to, I've got to make this ball. Do you think I'm going to focus on a target down there? I know I, I have a target. I'm here, put a, put a ball, just one ball down there. Not too close to the line. What are you trying to do, make me look bad? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so if that's my target, there's no way on the hit I'm focused on there. No way. I'm focused in on where? I'm using, how many of you ever shot a bow and arrow or or gun clay shooting or something like that. Do they say pull and the person shoots from down here? What do they do? They pull it close and they have sights or a gauge. I believe this is where the net used to be, needs to be used as a gauge. So watch me right here. I am literally uh, focused and at the net. I know where my target is and I'm using the net as my gauge, whether it be the pace, the spin, and so on, to get the ball there. I literally can see, and I'm not kidding, I do it every day, What I know what the player's thinking on the hit, period. I can see it in their eyes. I can see when they're down out of the moment. So, you try a few. Let's stay, I want you right there using the net as a gauge. I want you to rip it down the line. And I'm going to know if you lost your focus or not. So I don't want you to feel any pressure, but I'm going to lose my cheery personality. Yep. Where's the net? Now stop, 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 stop. Were you able to get your focus right here on the hit and use the net? No. 
I could tell right away. He did. Go ahead. Let's go. Let's see if we can see a difference. Now, yep, stay right there. Yep. Where's the net? Get it up and down. Yes. Now, if you ever watch the best of the best, real close, up close, on the court, and I've been blessed to do that, I've been blessed to play a lot of great players, but blessed to be on the court, these players, and you watch their eyes, you can see them working the ball right here. And you can see them, their eyes are open wide, no squinting, wide. And they, are, they have their target, but that's established early and they zero in using the net, the sidelines as their gauge. And that's when, can you go back to hit two or three balls with him? Putting Greg under a lot of pressure here because he hasn't hit much. So it's kind of like coming off the bench in the NBA. You know, I say go out there and shoot a three. Just don't get hurt with those balls. You guys focus in, not that you're not dead hard, The last two were excellent. Now, you see his head was there. Were you focused there? No. Nope. And you'll see almost every time he misses, he'll tell you he lost his focus. The idea is to train them to stay zeroed in right here on the hip and use, they have targets and using that net as the gauge. Obviously, they have the sidelines. Because the baseline, it's not that it's irrelevant. If your target is here, the baseline's not relevant. Using the net, the sideline, the gauge. This is where you're gauging. You don't need the baseline per se. That's already the distance you want to get the ball is already established. So when you worry about the ball going out, what is usually happens with your players? What usually happens when they worry about it going out? It usually goes out, you know? Sometimes they go net. All right, one more. A couple more. Now, when you see this, keep hitting, every aspect of technique improves. He's staying through the hitting zone. He's zeroed in. It's more balanced on the hit. There's more control. He's starting to get into a groove. Are you doing it better now or yes or no? Yeah, he is. I knew that. I'm leading him. You notice right away, he starts getting grooved in. That's what's happening when we watch great players, whether they conceptually understand, you know, aware of that or not. Okay, so of all the great players I played, and I have played a lot, and I've been on the court with uh, just, I don't know how many, I mean, just in practice, whatever. The number one thing, what do you think the number one thing is that you notice? How big they hit? No. How fast they are? Yeah. How difficult it is to rush them. You hit, you're, you think the person has hit a great shot, and they are very difficult. And part of that is the preparation speed, but then on the hit, they're right here in the moment. Okay, now, I gotta move, I'm running, I'm gonna run out of town, time. They'll run me out of town. Um, split step and golden move. I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut to this, uh, cut through this very quickly. The split, Remember I said psychologically they're in the moment? And I meant that. You see how when you, after now I've explained it on the visual system, how the person is focused here on the hip. I'll make this really simple, is that you just tell the person to focus in on when the other person is contacting the ball, timing their split, and right here that they want to have a target, but they also want to use the net as a gaze, keeping the chin there slightly after the hit. They don't need to know much, but it's very important. Now, we're going to go to the split step. Fastest way to, um, I want you to move Alex around pretty hard. The fastest way to improve the split step, to improve anticipation, to improve what I call tennis-specific athleticism, is to focus in, you don't concern yourself with where the ball is going, you focus in on timing the split, on when he's making contact, and a total, complete commitment to getting to every ball. 
This is the fastest way to perfect the footwork, the split step, by far. It's just very often not used. Okay, so we just watch Alex here. You stand in the corner, you can move him hard. And then just watch Alex, nothing else. Watch the split. Watch. Good, watch. Again. Now, no, that's fine. Now, when they do that, there's all kinds of learning that goes on. The brain recognizes, it makes a commitment to run for every ball. They start to get lower and they, they explode to the ball. There are a couple things just to make sure because I've got to cut this through it. Number one, when the ball is struck, there's a delay between when the brain, you, the brain, the eye send the signal to the brain to split and it actually happening. So when you look on slow motion, it's deceiving. It seems like the split step is later. But the player should be focused and timing their split right before the hit. And then there's a delay. The eye sends the signal to the brain, the brain sends it to the muscles, and then the response. So they focus on timing their split right before. While they are in the air, the brain tells, the visual system will tell the brain if they're in trouble, which way the ball's going, whether they have to adjust a fit more footwork before they land. Before they land. So the timing of the split, that's why you'll see players look like this. And you'll see them exploding and flowing. Because the brain has already told them, hey, you're in trouble, you got to go. So the timing of the split step is critical. And it's also critical that it is not conscious thought process of where the ball is going. Okay? So the timing of the split and then exploding is absolutely critical. Just do a couple. Now I'm going to move it along here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead because I want to allow for questions. When you tie in the split, now we know about the split. It's wider than shoulder width apart. You notice the guys seem to be a little wider split than they used to. And very low with the, the hips as they're exploding. So this move, I mean, you think you know how low it is until you show, see it on slow motion. And even for myself, these guys are really down low out of the split. That's absolutely uh, imperative that they do that. Then, this ties right into the other fundamental. What I say, the golden move. This is done on every single ground stroke. Split, turning is almost in the same move. This, this. Every ground stroke, usually the step out, hips, shoulders turn, out of the split. It's almost like a dance step, boom, here. So to just talk about the split, no. It's tied in, I call it the golden move. It's a fancy name for the unit turn. However, however, this is what I see people do with the unit turn a lot, ready? Turn sideways. No. 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 And heck no. I cleaned it up. The thing is, when you land out of here, the first move needs to include a separation angle between the shoulders and the hips. This is the loading process that at a world class level, high collegiate level, is required. Watch. See this here? Shoulders, hips are turned, shoulders are turned more. This is your golden move, almost every stroke. Okay, so go ahead and hit a few, just watch for the split in the first move. And this is what slows the game up. 
that move, and when you see, this is what I meant before, when I see somebody go like this, you know right away, they approach like this, they're done, because they don't load in the first move, they don't, they don't look to sink this, get this move. You see somebody do that, you know pretty much they are probably got a good stroke. You see this, go look at the draw and get, see who you play next. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, that's it. <laughs> Let's go, go ahead, a couple more. Good. Okay, now, because I'm running out of time and I did want to allow for some questions, the golden move, which is really what I, is a unit turn, but clarified, that it includes stepping out and a separation angle between the hips and the shoulders. Combined with timing of the split, good upper body posture, very low, and all that. When you do these two things here, combined with the watching of the ball, you are in the moment on the hit, you're in the moment when your opponent is hitting, you are psychologically in an optimum state. Optimum state. It's not easy to stay there. But that's why the split step and the art of watching the ball combine becomes incredible from a psychological perspective and incredibly important from the standpoint of a person staying in the moment, being able to explode and move Conversely, you will see when they're out of the moment, their split step goes away and their eyes look up on the hit. Very, very simple. In the heat of the battle, you'll see the split step is lost sometimes and the eyes go up, then you know they're totally out of the moment. Now, I'm going to leave it at that. And so I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'm gonna say thank you to Greg I want to say thank you to Alex. Give him a round of applause. And I will answer some questions, but I want to I want to mention one or two things. As I said before, uh, it is an incredible honor to come out here, um, and I'm trying and I've tried to present some information that maybe provokes thought. Uh, Maybe, as I said, you haven't heard before, or maybe it reaffirms what you already know. So hopefully you found one or two things there to be beneficial. So thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'll take one or two questions. Yes? You mentioned the golden move and the split step. Can you tell us a little bit more on the visual when, when the ball the pace changes to a much slower, more arcing ball? rather than to the rhythmic move to make it so much easier to time the ball when the pace is changing. Well, the question is, what's the difference when the pace changes? Nothing really, it's just the, when you, when you split, you start that, the first move starts coming like this, whether you have more time, fine. But you never would go like this and then go. So you always still incorporate the same move, which is the split and then in here. This move, if you watch, go to any of the sites, get any slow motion of any of the best players, and you will see this move in here all the time. Anything else? The, you know, the ability to keep the eyes level and keep the head up and mm -hmm. stay in that and recover that, does the natural physical attributes of a player, that the, the, where they are growing, uh, whether they're not strong enough, maybe mm -hmm. the lower by the center of gravity, does that come into play some? Yeah, the question is, and it's a good question, is with, with the keeping low and the upper body stable, does the physical conditioning uh, come into play and strength? Absolutely. Uh, it's one of the reasons why these guys look so solid, and they are so solid, they're so strong, and it takes years to get to that. So. With your player, especially if you've got a tall player, male or female, they're a, bit, a little bit like this, a bit of a kind of a boat in rocky seas. That makes it difficult for them, but that's why they have to work a great deal on their stabilizer muscles and core strength in order to um, be able to maintain this. 
Yes. And Nick, one, uh, this is kind for college guys, but also some of the uh, some younger players you guys know, are coming up. But it's, you know, I talk a lot about what you do off the ball is really important, and that's kind of what you're talking about here is this split, you know, the goal to move, et cetera. But you said not to be conscious of where the ball's going. I mean, because generally, if you hit cross court, you got to cover cross court. If you hit down line, you got to cover. But you're saying just be in the moment, like wherever the ball is, because you might they might go behind you. you, know, you got to want to be ready for wherever it is. Oh, okay. The question is, if I can repeat it is that, you know, if, if somebody hits cross court, you should be ready for the cross court. The answer is, is yes and no. No, you don't want to be focused in on the cross court. You, if it's been trained in you and deposited in your brain that when you hit a certain shot, the high percentages are over here, the brain has that store. And so you don't want to cheat that way unless they've got a sitter. As, as long as they don't have a sitter where you have to cheat, then by all means, you should be splitting, but the brain is recognizing all of this. That's why the brain's unbelievable. That's why when you drive a car, you know, all the history you've had in driving makes it so that you, after a few years, you're just flowing and things that are, you know, very few things surprise you on the road, yes. I talk to my players a lot about splitting, mm -hmm. and I, I just want to take your opinion about what I'm doing with them. I tell them the best time to split when the ball is the, out of the contact from the other person, and I and um, sometimes they think they have to go all the way to the, to the middle to split, like to recover all the way. So I tell them you, you're not always fast enough to get there, so you got to find a maybe halfway to split. And I also start with them with a drill that I always do, like as a warm-up. Because I always, I'm big on opening, I call it like the 45. Yeah. So I go like this and I say four hands and they go like that. Back hands and okay. go like that. Uh, so what do you think? What do I think? Yeah. That, I, you know, that's a nice warm up drill, but the, the genius of the split is in while you're timing the split. So when you're in the air, the brain picking up what's coming and it responds. So when is the best time to split? The, you want to split, start your split right before someone hits. Now, so you establish your balance right before. So if they're about to hit, you balance and then you go. That's why it looks so smooth when players are playing. If you're in desperate trouble and you're way off the court, well, then you're kind of cheating a little bit. You may, in order to recover, you may not be splitting there but that's when out of the norm when you're in real trouble that's when you can say pick a side try to guess which side they're going to go to last question yeah you mentioned the thing about speed ladder and your thoughts on that what do you do for footwork drills that in your academy my women's team always feels like they know their footwork needs to be improved so they want me to incorporate that stuff in practice and i always say you need to be able to do it when you're hitting the ball yeah not, you're not going to compete against all right, they say, the question is about the ladder and looking down. What word drills? Well, I don't know about you, but you can do all kinds of footwork drills. One, you can have a player stand here and you can have, say, a target um, here, here, middle, you know, around, and say, at an, I can split, and you say, we're going to work on the forward move on an angle to the forehand. So I'm going to go in the air and explode. So I'm going to go. See the way my feet adjusted? Watch. See, they adjusted right before I landed. OK, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to split. See the way the feet. So if I can know in advance and still work on my footwork. and really push it out but I just refute and disagree with anything that's done where you're looking down it makes no sense to me I'm, I'm a very simple kind of thinker in one regard I'm complex but I always bring it back to simplicity so when I talk to athletes it's really simple and so much so that I have to bite my tongue very often because somebody will come up and say yeah well you're just saying split when the other person's hitting, and, and they don't understand to the full extent of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. But anyway, got to go now. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to come out here. Thank you all for staying 
late and, and <laughs> listening to what I have to say. Thanks a lot.